Good evening. It is uh, time for our 23rd online session. Kind of, sort of. It's week 12. It's the first recorded session. As uh, usual, our second session will be on Zoom. But, well, it's Sunday night. It's 11.37, and I'm just getting started with this recording, which means I'm behind schedule. <sighs> well, maybe I'll go to bed at 1 a.m. <clears throat> That's my problem. It's not your problem. But, yeah, we have a problem. And I mentioned it during, during our Zoom session last week. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit more tonight. And that problem is keeping up with the videos. Because we have not seen students doing a good job keeping up with the videos. And that's not 100% your fault. Uh, I blame the school. Because the school started this semester saying, well, students are going to have a hard time. We're going to give them extra time to do recorded classes. We're going to make every week two weeks long. The problem with that is then people don't watch the videos until later, later, and then they have one or two or three other classes that they're behind on. And in my class, where there's one recording and then one live class, the live class wants to make use of what we did in the recording, but if you didn't watch the recording, then you're behind. Okay? So... People are not recording, are not completing the recording. It's a Monday recording. Uh, yeah, my EPA uh, one class in the daytime, their meeting is on Tuesday. But I put these recordings up Sunday night or Monday morning. And they're not watching the video before our next class, the Zoom class, Wednesday night for night class, Friday day for day class. They're not even watching it before the next week's classes. So, I made a new rule. We're not going to follow the school rule now. We're going to follow my rule. Let's take a look at the notice. Back to the Haksapjario. Check your attendance. Well, why are we doing this? We're doing this because there is an attendance problem, and I need to shrink my face a little bit to show you what the problem is. Let's take a look at last week. Well, actually, it looks pretty good right now because in uh, 19 minutes, the time will be over. Everybody has watched it from the 10th week. But remember, we're starting week 12 now. So let's take a week at week 11. The recording I put up Monday, Monday, the 25th of May, I put it up. And in the day class, there's still seven people who haven't watched it. Three people who are incomplete. So 10 out of 36 is about 30%. That's not so good. Take a look at the night class. It's about the same. The 10th week class is all done. Good for you. The 11th week class, 7, 8 out of 28. Again, around 30% of people haven't even watched the video from a week ago. But we had a class after that. So the new rule is from, well, let's take a look. Starting week 12, starting June 1, starting in 18 minutes, we got a new rule. And our new rule is very simple. I'm giving you six and three quarter days, 6.75 days to watch the first video or you're absent. I'll put the videos up Sunday night or by midnight or 1 a.m. Monday morning. This time looks like 1 a.m. 
And you must watch the first video, the video uh, when we do the Monday video, by 7 p.m. that same week, Sunday night. 7 p.m. Sunday night, the same week. Not quite seven full days. Got all of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, oops, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and most of Sunday. Okay, now I've marked attendance in the Edward system, Janta Chosukbu, as much as I can, all the way through last Wednesday's Zoom class. Actually, all the way through last Friday's Zoom class for the day students. This is the night nice students memo. So it's up to date. Please note that I have marked attendance for week 11 video. That is last week, Monday's video. And I've marked attendance for the May 18 week, May 18, May 19, week 10 video. Now, if you watch the week 10 video it'd be in the next 10 minutes, I'll change the absent to attend. And now I see almost everybody's done that. So I'll fix it. And if you watch the 11, week 11 video before June 7, I will change it. So last week's video i'm giving you two weeks i'm following the old rule but starting with this video starting this week it's a 6.75 day rule not a two-week rule also uh for the night class the may 20th the school holiday class it's not listed because officially it's scheduled for june 22 but don't worry i have the data I can upload it, but I can't do it yet because the school system won't let me. Can't put up time before the official scheduled time. But we know we did it. I have the video attendance reg record. Three people were absent in the night class. Two were very late or missed the end in the night class. Day class, uh, I didn't mark your absences in the message, the notice, but I have the information. Okay, important thing, if you feel the Janja Chosukbu is wrong, if you think there's incorrect information, please contact me directly. You can use Kakao, you can use uh, SMS, text messaging, you can send me an email. Tell me you think it's wrong. I will look it up. We can talk about it. All right? It's possible I make a mistake. The computer is not wrong, I'm sure. But I might have missed something. I do make mistakes. So let's check it out. Let me know if you think there's an error. Now, I do hope that my Wednesday night class watches the Monday recording before the Wednesday class. That's really tight. I know that's difficult for people who work. Day class, you have a little more time. I recorded on Monday. Your Zoom is on Friday. You have more time. You have no excuse. Okay. Giving you until Sunday for either class is a bonus. Okay. I'm giving you extra time. Remember, if we had a face-to-face -face class, you have no chance to reschedule. You have no bonus time. If we had a live Zoom class two times a week, you'd have no chance to reschedule. So, even 6.75 days is much better than no reschedule. You wouldn't have any extra days if we did it live. Come on, guys. Watch your videos. We can do this. All right. That's all we have for the Chosukbu. We can close this. That's all we have for the uh, CTL, message boards. There's nothing new here. Okay. Check your attendance. If we, if we scroll over to week 12, there's nothing there. So let's shrink this. I'm going to make myself bigger. How about that? Pull this down a little bit. And we go to the book. For the next few weeks, we work mostly in the book. 
We're on page 36. 36. It's another reading. Cell phone connection. You know what a cell phone is. Mobile phone, as they call it in Australia and, and some people in England. Hudepon, as they call it in Korea. Excuse me. Oh, my gosh. Almost midnight. So we're going to read the article, look at the picture underneath, and talk about it. Cell phone connection, page 36. When customers call you on the phone, they often aren't calling you from a telephone on their office desk. More and more, people are calling you when they're walking down the street or riding in the car. And they're making their calls on cell phones. In the early 1990s, the cell or mobile phone, the cell or mobile phone market was small. Makers sold 10 million units. Remember unit? Unit means a countable thing that you can sell by itself. Personal computer makers sold about 40 million units in the same period. In 1997, the picture changed. Consumers bought 100 million cell phones compared to 80 million PCs. Oh, here PC includes uh, Apple, Macintosh, okay? PC, personal computers of whatever type. In 1998, over 160 million cell phones were sold. By 1999, about 300 million people owned PCs, but 400 million had cell phones. Oh, sales. Sales of cell phones are continuing to grow each year. Cell phone makers Nokia and Motorola believe that 1 billion people will own at least one cell phone by the year 2003. By 2003. Nokia? Are they still making phones? They're not selling phones in Korea. Motorola? They are still making phones, but they almost died. And the cell phone of the future will be more than a mobile telephone. It will be a pocket-sized computer that can do everything a personal c computer can do. In fact, Nokia thinks that by 2004, more people will connect to the Internet by cell phones than from PCs. Well, Nokia was right, although I'm not sure about 2004 exactly. But definitely, certainly, clearly... People are using cell phones to connect to the Internet. And when you go to countries like the Philippines and India, oh gosh, and Africa, definitely, definitely, definitely lots more people use a cell phone to connect to the Internet than they use a PC. Partly that's because... Many people are using basically 3G technology to connect to the Internet in those countries. Okay, so the assignment is to complete the graph, the, the chart below. Draw a line to show cell phone sales in 1997 and 1998. Pretty simple. Go ahead, give it a try. Now, my drawing is really terrible, and actually the pen drawing I have here is not good, so I need to draw it again. Where's my pen? This will do, because you can't see this at all. And 1998. So it looks something like this. Pretty terrible drawing. I need to move my other hand. So you can see 1997, 1998, kind of, sort of. I don't know why they drew their chart the way they did. I don't know why I drew my chart the way I did. But anyway, 
you get the idea that it really shoots up. It takes off like a rocket between 1997 and 1998. Okay. Talk about it. Discuss the questions. We might come back to this in our class uh, later this week. How important is a cell phone in your daily work, not in your student life, in your future life? Is a cell phone important? If you're an office person, won't you be using an office phone? In fact, if you work at City Hall, you might be told you cannot use your cell phone. You have to leave it in your desk drawer all day except your lunch break. You might be told you have to leave your cell phone outside. If you work in the court, you have to leave your cell phone outside. They have lockers outside. You cannot take your cell phone into the building. If you work at City Hall, you might be surprised to discover that you cannot connect to your personal email and you cannot connect to your cacao while you're in the office. It's not allowed. How are you going to live? You're going to live by doing your work. You're going to live by doing your work. So in my EPA 3 class today, uh, the reading was about information overload. Information overload, like cognitive overload. Too much information coming. People can't do their job. Well... Yeah, so City Hall says we don't want you goofing around and playing with your own stuff, so you cannot connect to Cookcow. You cannot connect to your personal email during company hours. Many cities say that. Many companies say that. You know, They lock the computer and they say these are the only things you can use. But if you're a field agent, if you're a representative out in the field, you may be using your cell phone all the time. So how important is your cell phone versus your desk phone? If you live in a one room, perhaps you don't even have a, 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 a land line, right? You don't even have a land line. We say land line. You, know, you only have your cell phone. Many people living in, in one rooms only have a cell phone. All right. B, when do you and other people in your company usually use a cell phone again thinking in the future in your company all right so take a look on page 37 we've got a map on the bottom of the page this is a global times map and it's not exactly right it's not exactly right because for example Many countries use daylight savings time. Daylight savings time is a rule where we say we want to save electricity by changing the clocks. And we move the clock so that the sun stays longer in the evening. All right, we change the clocks. We we talk, we talk about spring forward and fall back. And there were a couple of years when Korea was doing it. They're not doing it now. So that, that changes things. Even in U.S., some states change times and some states don't, which is really crazy, but that's the way it works. But take a look at this uh, world map, and you see light sections and darker sections. That's just to give you an idea of one hour. As you know, the world is round. That's 360 degrees. A circle is 360 degrees. And the world turns slowly facing the sun. And it turns so that the sun rises for us in the east and sets in our west. And there's 24 hours in a day. 24 hours, 360 degrees means the average width wide width of a section a time zone in the world is 15 degrees one five 15 degrees but of course the earth is a globe so it's a, a ball so 15 degrees up at the top is very very narrow and 15 degrees at the equator is quite wide anyway for this numbers assignment 
take a look on the map and find your time zone. I'll give you a hint. You can probably find Japan easier than Korea. You can probably find Shanghai because it's written. But the map is not perfect because the map looks like Korea is in Shanghai time. But it's not. South Korea is in Tokyo time, is in Japan time. North Korea changed their time recently. I can't remember now. Are they a half hour different? There was a while, there was a point where they were half hour different, but now I'm not sure. And India is another country that doesn't follow the global time. They have a special own time. And Indonesia is another country that doesn't follow the global time, the, the lines on the map. They widened the time zone to include all their country and they moved to a half hour so that it's half hour too fast on one end of the country and half hour too slow on the other half of the country but all the countries in the same time zone anyway we get the general idea now when we're talking about time zones we base the world's time on what is basically London time. It's actually not really London. It's Greenwich. G-R-E-E-N-W-I-C-H. Don't worry about spelling it. Greenwich was the Royal Observatory. It's where the science of time and such is taken care of in England. And because England was a leading country in the world, when all this was done, the world decided that Greenwich Mean Time became the baseline for the world. So based on what you can see on the map as Paris, which is basically similar but not quite the same. If you look on the map, they look the same. But if you look at uh, uh, you know a, a north and south map, but if you look at the lines on the map, you'll see that England is all white. Paris is all blue, right? So the lines, the color lines don't follow the global lines. You have to look at the color lines. But as I said, they messed up Korea because Korea should be Shanghai time. Uh, Korea should be Japan time. Tokyo time and Seoul time is the same. So they messed up this map. It's not right. Now, we talk about Greenwich Mean Time called GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. But we also talk about UMT. And U means universal, more than global. That includes the sun and the moon. It's nonsense. But anyway, so you'll hear UMT, universal mean time. Now, if I remember correctly, I think I'm right. Seoul is minus 8 or minus 9. Let's just find out. I'm going to reduce my time, reduce myself, and go up here and do world clock. Search for world clock. Click world clock. And we'll just move this a little bit. Let's look for Seoul. And it says, right now, Seoul, it is just past midnight. Now, let's see the difference. Let's look at London. London's over here. London is 401. So there's eight hours difference. We are eight hours earlier or later. People argue how to talk about it. But anyway, we are UMT plus eight. Okay. Seoul is midnight. And here we go. Taipei is one hour earlier or later, however you want to look at it. It's only 11. But Tokyo, ah, the clock's just changed. Tokyo is the same time as Seoul. 
and that is London time plus 8. So we would say UMT plus 8. And if we look at Los Angeles, because Los Angeles is the same time zone as San Diego, California, where I'm from, we can see that it is 8 a.m. So if we look again at London, 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 where did you go? Oh, right above it. London is 16 or 4 p.m. And Los Angeles is 8. That's eight hours difference. Eight, Los Angeles is eight hours less because it's daylight savings time in California right now. They've changed the clocks for the summer. So Los Angeles is UMT minus eight. So that's how it works. The numbers on this map on page 37 Item number four says find the time zone you live in, right? Zero plus one plus two plus three. Don't worry about that because the map's not so good. But we are going to listen, number five, and find out what are the times in three cities. And then you'll want to subtract or add the number of hours. All right? So let's give it a try. It's challenging, okay? This is one of the things where the content is hard, not just the listening. Remember, content and language. Here we've got a language problem, but we also have a content problem. So let's go ahead and shrink that, raise that somewhat, and we'll slide this in here, and we're going to track eight. Let's play. Page 37, Numbers. Exercise 5. Listen. What time is it in these cities right now? Add or subtract the number of hours in the boxes. Write the times only. A. What time is it in Sao Paulo? B. Do you know the time in Calcutta? C. What's the time in Johannesburg? D. Now, you're looking at me and saying, Professor, what am I supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. Now you know what the challenge is. So if you take a look at your map on the page, you can start counting numbers or times. Okay, plus one, plus two, plus three, minus one, minus two, minus three. I explained that to you. So, take a look at Greenwich. That, or we could say London. That's above Paris. It's in a white line. That line dances around a little bit, but it comes back down to the bottom of the page. In that section, write zero. We're going to say that it is noon, nice and easy, noon in London, just as I talked about before. Now, you might want to go ahead and start counting off numbers from there. So if you move one to the right, it'll be a dark blue section. It will be Paris. And remember we said how Korea is plus. So Paris is going to be plus one. So if it is 12 or noon in London, it will be 1 p.m. or 13. If you want to think in the 24 hour clock, military clock, it will be 13 in Paris. So take 30 seconds now. I'm going to run and get a glass of water. Take 30 seconds and number those lines on your chart. If white for London is 12, then Paris will be 13. Go ahead and write on your chart.
Okay, we're back. So you got your numbers. We're going to go back to the beginning of this. And when they say the city, you have to find the city on the map and then write down the right number. Got it? Set? Let's go. Page 37. Numbers. Exercise 5. Listen, what time is it in these cities right now? Add or subtract the number of hours in the boxes. Write the times only. A. What time is it in Sao Paulo? Got it? So if it is noon in London, then we got a blue line in the Atlantic, then we got a white line in the Atlantic, then we got a blue line for Sao Paulo. So minus one in the blue, minus two in the white, minus three is Sao Paulo. Twelve minus three. It is nine AM in Sao Paulo. Got it? Keep going. B. Do you know the time in Calcutta? C. What's the time in Johannesburg? D. Do you know what time it is in Los Angeles? E. What time is it in Paris, France? F. What time is it in Mexico City? G. What's the time in Melbourne? H. Do you know what time it is in Shanghai? Okay. So, how challenging was it? Remember, you're just counting pluses and minuses from 12 noon. I'm not going to spend time on this tonight. This is more of a world knowledge item for you. Hope you'll think about it. Remember, some places use daylight savings time. To be honest, if you're connected to the Internet, you can always find the time. And in fact, on your phone, even if you are not connected to internet, your phone probably has a clock that can adjust to different places. It just wants to know daylight savings time or not. All right? And it may even tell you that we expect it's daylight savings time. Okay, turn the page. Page 38. Describing locations. Now, we're going to spend time on Chapter 7 and Chapter 8, and we're going to use some outside materials because, you know what? Directions, locations, these are difficult. It's not just a language problem, but it is a language problem. There's lots of people who cannot give directions, who cannot explain locations even in their first language. They grew up speaking a certain language, but they're just not good with directions and locations. But it is a very common thing, right? Somebody says, oh, excuse me, where's the post office? Or I can't find the knife. Where's the knife? So we're going to start with the book. And then I'm going to have some extra materials to work with, and we're going to spend time. The first thing I want to mention is that there is a difference between locations and directions. Well, yeah, sure, of course. Let's be a little more precise. Locations and directions. Location. Oh, I can't type. I cannot type. Means where it is. I still cannot type. Goodness gracious.
direction means how to go there. How to go there. And in fact, in English, if you're going to give directions, usually we give the location first. And then somebody says, huh, where's that? How do I go there? And then you have to explain how to travel, right? So directions and locations, we usually start with location, where it is, and then we go to direction. No, don't save. So take a look at this picture on page 38. You can see some kind of office, maybe. Maybe it's home. I'm not quite sure. And the picture is a little confusing, so we'll we'll talk about that too. First, objectives to ask for, describe, and confirm location of places and objects. To exchange information about locations in buildings. We are going to talk about in the room, in the building, and in the city. In the room, in the building, and in the city. Start with this picture. Take a look. Now, one of the challenges when we talk about location is our point of reference. Point of reference. <clears throat> what that means is, for example, is the man thinking about where something is when he looks at it? Or we talking about as you walk into the room and you look at the man, your point of reference. So for the man who is sitting at the table, the computer is on his left side. But if I am looking at the man in the table, I would say the computer is on the right side. So left or right, it depends on your perspective. Notice I said left side. I raised my left hand. But that's on the right side of your monitor. And when I said right side, I raised my right hand, the hand I write with. But it's on the left side of your monitor. So point of reference. Your perspective makes all of this stuff harder. Now, we also have a few other words here that are commonly confused, blurred, blended. And we're going to talk about those. And I'm going to have some images for you, but not tonight. OK, so first of all, where is it? Look at the picture, complete the sentences, use the words in the box. A, a manager is sitting behind a desk. What? Is that a desk? That looks like a table to me. Desk or table? Desk or table? What's the difference? Anybody? Desk? table. What's the difference? Usually when we think about a desk, we think about the fact that it is a workplace. It is a place where we do work. And table can be for eating, for social. But that's not the only difference. Often we think a desk has drawers. Let me raise my hand here where you can see it. Like Sarapchang. Okay. It has drawers to put things. Now those drawers might be thin to put a few papers or some pencils or or they might be very tall and you can hang hangers in it 
And sometimes a desk doesn't have drawers, but it has spaces or places to put things. under the table or 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 desk you know underneath that flat part or maybe over on top of not just put it on the on the desk top of the table top but it has kind of like shelves one shelf or two shelves whereas a table generally doesn't have any of these things it doesn't have shelves, doesn't have spaces or places to put things underneath or above. It doesn't have drawers. Okay. We ate dinner at a table. Think about going to a restaurant. That's a table, probably not a desk. But not everybody agrees always exactly what is what. So in this picture, we notice there are no drawers, no spaces or places under the table, or above the table to put things. So maybe it's a table. But it seems to be his workspace, and they said it's an office, and the chair he's sitting in is a businessman chair, and the two chairs facing him are not businessman chairs, but they're not restaurant or dinner chairs or home dinner chairs. They're office chairs. So I guess this is his workspace. So he calls it a desk. Okay. Now the man is sitting behind the desk. Well, it's a round desk. But compared to us walking in, he is behind the desk. Not in front of, but behind. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This class, this week, next week, will be more difficult for me to teach because I usually do this in a classroom where I can walk around easily. So I might make a video somewhere separate to help show how I usually move around. But anyway, picture A, a man is sitting behind a desk. In the, in the yellow box under the picture, we have eight words or eight phrases. Above, next to, behind, on, between, to the right of, in, and under. Now, part of the problem we have here are what you can call contrast words or opposites. Let's start with my favorite. It's not part of this picture, but if I say big, you say usually students give the wrong answer. If I say large, you say Well, most native speakers will say the opposite of big is little. The opposite of large is small. Don't believe me? Okay. I know Koreans love to say big and small. Think about it. If you go to the store to buy clothes, they have S for small, M for medium, L for large, X for extra large, triple X for, oh my gosh, yeah, right, large and small. And big and little are opposites, not big and small. That's just opposites. That's the pair. That's how we match them. Now, same way, over, above, Well, these ones actually rhyme over and under, above and below. And we have one more word that doesn't match anything. 
beneath. Beneath and below are very similar. So what is the difference between over and above? Here's where my uh, classroom be is very, very helpful, but I'm going to try and do it without a classroom. This is a box, some kind of medicine, uh, eye drops, but it's just a box. Okay, It's just a box, not important. The box is on my head. It doesn't balance. Whatever. The box is on my head. Okay, it's on. That's easy. The box is, is it over my head or above my head? Forward and back. Left and right. If I can drop it and it falls on, hits my head, if it can hit my head, then it is over. It is over. If it is off to one side, it's still higher than me. But if it's off to one side and I drop it, it does not hit my head. It is not over me. It is above me. It is higher than me. It is above me. But it's not actually over me. Now, this is one of those things where not everybody agrees perfectly, and you look in some dictionaries and it says over equals above, above equals over. But if we have to make a distinction, that's how we do it. Over can hit you in the head. Above maybe doesn't hit you over the head. And we can use the same for any items if it is in alignment so that the higher thing can fall and hit the lower thing, it is over. And if it is not in alignment, the higher thing falls, it doesn't hit the lower thing, well, it's still above, it's still higher than, but it's not over. So over, under. Oh, it's too far out of your picture, you can't see it. Above, below matches the same idea. Now, if it is above you, it could also be over you. Everything over you is above you. Okay, so one is a wider word. Above is anywhere higher than you. But over is only exactly. All right? It works both ways. It's not only left and right. It can be forward and back. It's too far behind me. All right, so over, above, beneath, below, uh, over, above, under, below, and beneath. And beneath it seems to be like below. Doesn't seem to be uh, any difference. Over, under, above, below, beneath. Uh, I usually talk about this in a classroom with a table, but because my camera is tight here, uh, it's not convenient to use a table, so I used a box and my head. So, a manager is sitting behind a desk. B, there's a light. Where is it? Look at the top of the picture. Well, we can see that there is no over the desk in this picture. So we have to use above. C, there's a laptop computer. Maybe the best answer is on the desk. Or, yeah, on the desk, on the table, on the desk. D, there are some folders.
what can we say? I might want to say across from, but in this case, that's not an option. So I have to say to the right of, maybe. The folders are, oh, you can't see my hands. Between, the folders are between the telephone and the computer. Not exactly in the middle between, but still, if there's three things, A, B, and C, A is here, A is here, C is here, and B is in the middle. It's between, somewhere in the middle, but not exactly in the middle. It's between. F, there's a wastebasket. Is it to the right of the table? Well, we already used to the right. So we, I guess we're going to have to say under. Is it really under? Over under? Seems like it's a little bit off to the side. So as I said, this over under above below is not precise. People disagree. But something like that. A newspaper is in the wastebasket. And there's a briefcase, 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 keep praise, under the table. Okay, we have to use under for under the table here. Well, what does that mean about the trash can? Maybe it's to the right of. And we can we can argue about these things. It, these ideas of location, it's not rocket science. People argue. What does this word mean? What does that word mean? People do argue. All right, above, next to, behind, on, between, to the right of, in, and under. So maybe the trash can is to the right of the table. For the man is to the right, but from my perspective, it's to the left. So, uh -huh. That's why giving locations can be so challenging. Who's looking at it and what are they thinking? The yellow box here says office objects, briefcase, calendar, desk, folders, laptop, computer, light, telephone, and wastebasket. I want to warn you that often when I do our final exams, I put many things on my desk or on my table in my room. And I ask students, where is something? And I say, usually tell me three ways to describe it. So the pencil is next to the pen on the table near the calculator. Things of that nature. All right. So typical ordinary office things. You should get familiar with these words. And there's a lot of them in this book. And you've seen them elsewhere, okay? And if it comes to something like an office thing, you don't know the word, and you say, oh, next to the gesangi, I'll give you that, all right? I'll give you that. I won't insist that you know the word calculator. If you know gesangi, because the point of the question is the location. All right. I'm going to go ahead and play this uh, conversation as a starter. We will do it again as we go through this book in our live class. But let's see, recording number 10. Page 39, conversation. It's on the second floor. Exercise three. Read and listen to the conversation. Excuse me, where's the Air Mexico office? Air Mexico? It's on the second floor. On the second floor? Yes. It's the first office to the right. But it doesn't open until 10 today. That's OK. Is there a coffee shop in the building? Yes. There's one over there, across from the newsstand. Across from the newsstand? Okay, thank you very much. 
You're welcome. Listen again and repeat. Excuse me, where's the Air Mexico office? Excuse me, where's the Air Mexico office? You should repeat, huh? Air Mexico? Try again. It's on the stand. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Please repeat. We're going to follow the recording. Listen again and repeat. Excuse me, where's the Air Mexico office? Excuse me, where's the Air Mexico office? Air Mexico? It's on the second floor. Air Mexico? It's on the second floor. On the floor. second floor? On the second floor? Yes. It's the first office to the right. But it doesn't open until 10 today. Yes, it's on the second floor on the right. But it doesn't open until 10 That's today. That's okay. Is there a coffee shop in the building? That's okay. Is there a coffee shop in the building? Yes. There's one over there, across from the newsstand. Yes. There's one over there, across from the newsstand. Across from the newsstand. Okay, thank you very much. Across from the newsstand. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, so, um, I'm going to introduce a couple of ideas to you now, and we will look at them more visually in our Zoom class. But perhaps you have heard and maybe you have seen in Korea the fact that Americans and British don't agree with the meaning of first floor. Because Americans tend to say the first floor is the floor at ground level. When you walk into the building, you're on the first floor. But the British idea is that the first floor means the first level above the ground floor. The first level up. So when you walk into the building, you're on the ground floor. And you walk up the stairs to reach the first floor. Americans and British perfectly disagree about the meaning of first floor. But what I'm going to show you in class next time is how sometimes we have to use both uh, in U.S. How the Americans sometimes use the British system. And now if here in Korea, you'll sometimes see kind of a halfway, especially a lot of the one-room apartment complexes, the, the one-room system, where the street level, the ground level, is where cars park. And then... You go in an elevator, you walk up the stairs, and now there are first floor apartments. And the rooms are numbered 101, 102, 103, 104, 105. That's kind of the British system. right? It's the first floor above ground. Anyway, that's what we're going to talk about in the next class. The first idea is the idea of first floor, second floor. The second thing we're going to talk about in class is the idea of across and in front of. Because Koreans and many other countries think about this differently. And so, again, it's something I usually do in a live class, but it doesn't work so easily on a close-up camera. So I'm going to have to try to find some pictures or something to help explain it in a less boring way. So for tonight, remember the key words were desk versus table. Desk as some place you work on, a working space, workplace. It often has drawers. If it doesn't have drawers, it has spaces or places to put things above or below the tabletop. And a table doesn't have these things. It's often thought of as a place for eating or for social activities. But we can work at a table. And then the opposites are big and little, large and small. Over, under, above, below, beneath. And for over, under, above, below, they're not exactly different. People don't agree perfectly. But in general, 
we could say over and under means something can fall on your head and above below means maybe fall on your head or maybe on the side that's all for tonight i'll see you in class thank you very much